Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, I have uh, the special privilege of introducing a uh, friend, uh, someone who's uh, made a very distinguished career, um, has been in a uh, opera trajectory for the last two decades. Uh, Melinda Desai is the Harlem Family Endowed Chair in Cardiovascular Medicine, Professor of Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. He's also Honorary Professor at University of Oxford and director of the clinical operations and the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy center in Cleveland. He's got his uh, degree in medicine uh, from the Municipal Medical College uh, at Gujarat in uh, India. Uh, then he moved to America when he did his training in internal medicine at the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine, following up with cardiology at uh, Allegheny General Hospital and uh, then cardiac imaging training at the John Hopkins and then at the NIH. He joined the faculty at Cleveland Clinic just about the time when I was uh, leaving uh, in 2005. Uh, so we overlapped for a little bit and I had uh, the privilege of uh, spending um, uh, time with him uh, as a colleague and later on uh, participated in, in, in many um, uh, programs uh, where we uh, uh, were jointly together. He had uh, been focused uh, primarily uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where he leads now the one of the most important centers in the world for the management of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In, and he has authored uh, some of the most important uh, publications over the last two decades in this topic. Um, he is uh, an example of someone who's uh, quite accomplished clinically, uh, but also academically um, and uh, as a leader. So uh, thank you again for joining us, Milin. We're looking forward to uh, listen to your presentation. Thank you, uh, Mario. Thanks for the kind introduction. And you guys can hear me and see the slides, correct? Perfect. So uh, I, it is my hope that in the next 45 minutes or so, I give you how I think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the grand scheme of things. And here are my disclosures. So before we start, we need to do some simple math. Uh, HCM uh, is thought to have a prevalence of about one in 500. Some folks seem to think the prevalence could be one in 200. If that's the case, there's about 15 to 20 million patients affected worldwide. In USA, we know of about 100,000. That means even in USA, there's about 85% patients that are undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, or underdiagnosed. So at the very least, what we have is lots of opportunities to improve diagnosis. And once that happens, lots of opportunities to treat. So. Like everything else, step one, step one cannot be anything other than multimodality imaging. You have to be able to establish the diagnosis and phenotype. You have to recognize, are there anything, is, is there anything else going on? Then once you have made the diagnosis, you have to be able to ascertain symptoms. Are they due to outflow tract obstruction? Is the obstruction due to basal septal hypertrophy, mitral valve problem, papillary muscle problem, or are the symptoms due to diastolic dysfunction without obstruction and mid-cavitary apical hypertrophy? You have to be able to ascertain the risk of sudden cardiac death and what are some of the familial and genetic implications. These four images on the right are all HCM patients, but they all look different. The top left is very thick septum, Top right is apical HCM, concentric HCM, and the bottom right is somebody who has no hypertrophy due to papillary muscle problems. This patient, uh, echo remains the mainstay while cardiac magnetic resonance offers complementary uh, value. Let, we will talk about imaging in the next few slides. An important thing to realize, not all HCM is thick walls and not all thick walls are due to HCM, okay? 
These are two examples. The one on the left is a person who's gene negative, but with massive hypertrophy uh, of the septum and late peaking outflow tract gradient. This person, obviously, we treated them with a standard myectomy. On the right is somebody who has no hypertrophy, severe SAM, very symptomatic due to abnormal papillary muscle. And this person happened to be gene positive. So for this person, you cannot do a myectomy. We developed a new procedure, and we will talk about that in a little bit. Bottom line is, do you want to be looking like the kid on the top or a well-dressed person like the bottom? You know, it has to be a tailored approach. Another important aspect of HCM, especially the non-obstructive HCM, is the apical variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It is increasingly being recognized as a bad actor. Uh, Patients with apical aneurysm have a 6.4% per year risk of events, which is three folds greater than people who do not have aneurysm. So if you see somebody, first step is make sure you look for the phenotyping. If you diagnose apical variant, you have to make every effort to look for an apical aneurysm. Cannot underscore the importance of using contrasts and adapting the views. Strain is emerging as, a, as an important factor in, like in all other diseases. And a couple of papers we published large scale, which have shown that strain does provide incremental prognostic value. Not only prognostic value, but perhaps even ascertain differential diagnosis like amyloidosis. The images on the right are almost 2,300 patients in HCM registry, which is an NIH registry, where we utilize uh, feature tracking cardiac MRI and have determined that there are some aspects, I mean, you know, what are the things that cause abnormal uh, uh, strain include the morphology, outflow tract obstruction plays into it, uh, gadolinium enhancement, as well as abnormal T1 kinetics. So this state, this uh, field is in a state of evolution and more to come in the next few years. So I alluded to the HCMR registry. That is almost 2,800 HCM patients from more than 40, country, 40 sites across many countries. A lot of papers, I mean, this is in the, uh, in the closing stages of its long-term follow-up. And so in the next couple of years, I expect a lot of papers to come out demonstrating its incremental prognostic value of CMR and SCAR, et cetera. But we are learning a few new things including you know, the association between sarcomeric mutation and the shape of the, of the uh, septum, more fibrosis in those patients, and, and you know, different things we are learning as we are going along. Machine learning, now this is evolving rapidly, and uh, in a sub-study out of the HCMR registry, in almost 2,400 patients, we have developed uh, machine learning algorithms that can detect based on the shape who will obstruct, who may obstruct at rest, who may be genotype negative. So again, lots of evolution happening, lots of new stuff coming along. There's data emerging on artificial intelligence where you can utilize EKG and identify patients with HCM with a very high degree of sensitivity and specificity. But I'm going to very strongly caution everybody to look at this data carefully because as we all know, different ethnicities, especially African American uh, ancestry has a higher rate of ECG abnormalities without the diagnosis of HCM. So we have to make sure that we are, you know, AI is not be all end all. You have to be able to know exactly what you're doing. And, and make assertions. You cannot be adding any more angst to an already anxious patient. A few other things as it relates to AI. Uh, this is uh, the image on the left, which showed that utilizing machine learning algorithms is, was found to be superior for wall thickness measurements and of course, faster. Just recently, we published last year from, again, HCMR registry, where we can utilize machine learning to, to, uh, to predict which patients are going to develop outflow tract obstruction. 
including various mitral valve and papillary muscle measurements. Step two, in my opinion, is you, it is absolutely important to be able to elicit outflow tract obstruction. If you don't look, you won't find, and if you won't find, you cannot treat. Obstruction is worse than having no obstruction. And it is important that you recognize that it is necessary to uh, utilize all means. We use resting gradients, Valsalva, treadmill, bike, in many cases, amyl nitride. At rest, gradients are seen in only 25% patients, but with provocation, it is seen in almost 70% patients. Again, I'm going to show you this image of a patient with no wall thickness who was told they were anxious. When we did amyl nitride and put him on a treadmill, he developed all the symptoms with severe outflow tract obstruction. So bottom line is designating somebody as non-obstructive HCM without the full extent of provocation is not appropriate. Stress echo, we utilize a fair bit of it in our patients, especially to help promote or provoke latent symptoms as well as assess functional capacity. In many cases, we also, uh, the gradients at rest are not very helpful and we provoke severe gradients and assess MR along with blood pressure response and arrhythmias. In this study we published a few years ago, 430 patients that were deemed to be asymptomatic. They come to the clinic saying, we have no symptoms. We put them on a treadmill, only 18, 1.8% patients achieved 100% predicted meds. And the ones that achieved had an excellent long-term survival versus the ones that did not achieve uh, their predicted meds. So there's a lot of value in doing uh, uh, stress echocardiography and it is safe. Step three, always be on the lookout for typical and atypical variants of obstructive HCM. We have plenty of patients, and we were one of the earliest to describe, a lot of patients have obstructive cardiomyopathy phenotype without the basal septal hypertrophy due to abnormal mitral and papillary muscle morphology. Majority of them are going to be the thick wall type, but you will see uh, in a large enough practice there's pap muscle abnormalities, portal attachment abnormalities, uh, mitral valve abnormalities. And so fundamentally, designating somebody as not being HCM based on lack of LVH without the full extent of provocation is also not appropriate. These are three different patients of mine with three different flavors of atypical outflow tract obstruction. The top panel is somebody with elongated anterior mitral leaflet, the middle panel, no hypertrophy, but patient has bifid hypermobile papillary muscle. And the bottom uh, panel is somebody who got operated for chest pain, thought it was angina, continued to have symptoms. We found that this person was having outflow tract obstruction due to abnormal portal attachment. So three different, none of them have basal septal hypertrophy. Step four, always be on the lookout for phenocopies as well as other types of uh, diseases. Strain has helped a lot. There are four different strain patterns. The top left is your standard HCM. Top right is your apical HCM with apex strain is low. Flip side is the amyloid apical sparing in the bottom right where there is Preserve strain in the apex and everything else is reduced. And a hypertensive heart disease with just a normal appearing strain. You can utilize CMR uh, with gadolinium to ask a di differential diagnosis for Fabre's disease, amyloid, athlete's heart, et cetera. Fundamentally, it is important to go the distance if you suspect a, a different disease process, especially now that we have drugs for HCM as well as amyloid and Fabre's disease. It is important to make the correct diagnosis. These are 2,500 myectomies done at Cleveland Clinic. What we found we, when we looked at the pathology, even in an experienced center like the Cleveland Clinic, one in five had an alternative diagnosis. So it is important to be humble and be on the lookout for, for something that doesn't make sense, if it doesn't make sense. 
Next step, it is crucial to uh, do risk stratification in these patients. And there are two schools of thought. The American North American school of thought involves uh, categorical variables, malignant family history, severe LVH, more than 30 millimeters, unexplained syncope, non-sustained VT, gadolinium enhancement more than 15% of LV mass, burnt out HCM or apical aneurysm. Again, this is why looking for apical aneurysm is crucial. The Europeans use a continuous formula based on many similar criteria to come up with a sudden cardiac death risk score at five years. And if your score is more than 6%, ICD is indicated less than 4%, it is not recommended. Which one is better? At, bottom line is you need to use at least one or both. But study has this study has shown that the number needed to uh, treat to prevent one sudden cardiac death is lower with the American ACC AHA guidelines versus the ESC guidelines. So it has a more uh, it is more sensitive as you are trying to pick a needle in a haystack. Bottom line is when do you recommend ICD? If you had a prior event, ICD is class one. If you have one of the risk factors that we talked about, ICD is reasonable. If none, look for non-sustained VT. If you have it in a child, ICD is reasonable. In an adult, if you have non-sustained VT and extensive myocardial fibrosis, ICD could be considered. Just to permit participation in sports is not a uh, in indication to place an ICD. Multiple papers have been published in the context of myocardial fibrosis assessment and outcomes. This is something we published a few years ago in more than 1,400 patients, where we have shown that 14%, 15% myocardial fibrosis is a cutoff for association with adverse outcomes. And that is also what is utilized in the guidelines. And we showed it in all groups obstructive with or without myectomy, non-obstructive, uh, you know, uh, every this provides incremental prognostic value. Of course, the HCMR registry will help us further ascertain uh, whether this indeed provides incremental value. Screening, echo for first degree relatives is an important tool. So cascade screening is necessary and in Poor images, or if you if you if there's suspicion, then CMR can provide adjunct value. So genetics and imaging, the combination of two, have to be utilized in terms of of screening for uh, family members as well as genotype positive, phenotype negative patients. Now let, I'll focus mostly on management. At baseline, at the very least, you need to be doing lifestyle modification. So along with assessing the risks, screening family members, you know, control symptoms, uh, volume depletion, isometric exercise eval uh, assessment, avoiding the wrong kind of drugs are some important things. It is important to be able to recognize which medications to avoid, especially ACE, ARB, nifedipine, digoxin, nitroglycerin. Beta blockers, verapamil, diltiazem, and diazopyramide have been traditionally used, and we will talk about that in a, in a second. It is crucial to screen for obstructive sleep apnea because they go hand in hand. Lifestyle consideration. So there's emerging data and Yesterday, and I will talk about that in a second, uh, there's fresh guideline, fresh data coming about physical activity. But shared decision-making is important. Pregnancy, we never not advise patients to get pregnant. It's just shared decision-making is important and initiation of guideline-directed therapy. It is important to manage comorbidities because they add fuel to the fire. Endocarditis prophylaxis, the guidelines don't recommend, but again, shared decision-making is important. So this was published less than, uh, it was published literally 20 hours ago as a late-breaking trial yesterday at ACC, the Live HCM trial, 1,500 patients from eight to 60 years, all HCM, 
42% exercise vigorously, 43% moderately, and 16% inactive. What the primary endpoint showed that there was no difference. There was no increased primary composite event of mortality, arrest, arrhythmia, et cetera. Secondary analysis showed no difference between vigorous sedentary, moderate sedentary, and vigorous versus moderate group. So bottom line is this field is rapidly evolving and the guidelines should change about restriction of physical activity. Moving on to therapies. There are no real prospective randomized controlled trials comparing various FDA approved medical therapies, invasive therapies versus FDA approved medical therapy and myectomy versus alcohol septal ablation. There's some data, disopyramide, New York has played a big role in use of disopyramide, but most of the data on disopyramide is retrospective observational and diso has a lot of side effects. Recent study has shown that beta blockers, prospective study, can, it can lower LVOT gradients, reduce dyspnea, but it did not make a change in maximal capacity. So currently, most of the recommendations are level of evidence C or consensus opinion. It is important to recognize that medical treatment cannot be worse than the disease. We have to be careful about over-treatment in terms of orthostasis, dizziness, bradycardia, QT intervention, QT interval prolongation. Erectile dysfunction is a big problem in young men. Overzealous restriction of physical activity results in deconditioning, obesity, and all those things that we know about. Genetic drugs and not having good impact is a real thing and should be taken into consideration. So sometimes you reach a point where enough is enough and sometimes septal reduction therapy is the best option. So as I alluded to earlier, septal reduction therapy is not a one size fits all. In majority of the patients with thick wall, you do a myectomy. But if you have no thick wall, then you've got to get creative. You need to work on your mitral valve. You may need to work on papillary muscle, uh, where we reorient the papillary muscle away from the outflow tract. Bottom line is you need an experienced center with an experienced team of providers. If you have that, this is data from 2,300 Cleveland Clinic patients where we showed that doing surgery, uh, the image on the right, you know, if you do isolated myectomy or myectomy in combination with mitral valve procedure, there's no diff outcome penalty. And if you add a place like Cleveland Clinic, if we offer a slightly earlier surgery at class two with drug intolerance, the outcomes were better than waiting for patients to develop symptoms. So we routinely offer surgery, have been routinely offering surgery for drug intolerant patients or people with uh, symptoms who also have impaired physical activity. If done right, quality of life after surgical myectomy, this is data we published last year, significant improvement in Kansas City summary score, bigger than anything else, uh, almost a 35 to 37 point absolute increase in Kansas City score at one year. Alcohol septal ablation is something that can be used at the Cleveland Clinic. We routinely use it if the patient is not a surgical candidate, but it requires appropriate perforator anatomy and adequate size septum, no pulmonary hypertension or papillary muscle issues. So it is important that experience is also necessary here and right anatomy. When do we recommend the guidelines recommend invasive therapy? Experienced providers for severe drug refractory symptoms and outflow tract obstruction, consider doing additional uh, operations if there are uh, atypical variants. In advanced symptomatic patients where surgery is not an option, recommend uh, alcohol septal ablation. Now, these guidelines have also evolved, and if you have pulmonary hypertension or AFib, poor functional capacity, uh, experience center where they patients don't tolerate medical therapy. So these are class 2B indications suggesting an earlier operation. Of course, operating on asymptomatic individuals or just routinely doing mitral valve replacement is a class 3 indication. But 
it is important to recognize, you know, if you just do simple math, I'll, we don't do, we don't have enough good surgeons and we don't do enough good procedures. There's a lot of patients on the left hand of the spectrum with mild disease who may benefit from uh, medical therapy before we talk about doing heart surgery. Also, it is important to recognize that expert centers have better SRT outcomes and there are not enough expert specialty centers. If you go to an expert center, death rate is one in more than 1,500. If you go to a low volume center, it is one in six. So you should always send the patient to an experienced center. But what is the reality? This is something we published a couple of months ago. Medicare analysis reveals that myectomy is better than alcohol in the long run. Both of them reduce heart failure burden and there is a inverse association between worse outcomes and in, uh, higher volume uh, centers. Having said that, Having said that, 770% patients undergo SRT at low volume centers. So guidelines are good, but people are not following the guidelines. That's why I think there is a, an unmet need to increase the tent that offers more treatment alternatives. That brings us to cardiac myosin inhibitor. Mavacampin is first in class. It is an inhibitor of myosin. So HCM has a hypercontractile state. So Mavacampton makes the heart contract normally. Heart also has impaired relaxation and abnormal myocardial energetics. So Mavacampton improves all those things also, and it is thought to have a low arrhythmogenic potential. In basic science study, it has shown to prevent disease phenotype. It it reduces pro-hypertrophic and pro-inflammatory signaling. It also reduces the development of myocardial fibrosis. So lots of basic science data pointing us in the right direction. What have the phase three con randomized controlled trials shown? So till now, nothing in HCM was prospective data. Now we have a few randomized controlled phase three trials. The two... Uh, done uh, in the context of Mavacampton include Explorer HCM, which included mildly symptomatic class two and three symptoms. Patients uh, with, on monotherapy with beta blocker calcium or disopyramide and Valor HCM, which is advanced symptomatic patients on maximally tolerated medical therapy, including potentially disopyramide. Every patient was referred for surgical or al a surgical myectomy or alcohol septal ablation. What did Explore HCM show? 73% patients were in NYHA class three, significant improvement in resting and provocable gradient without worsening of ejection fraction. And the primary endpoint of significant improvement in functional capacity as well as NYHA class was seen in Mavacampton group compared to placebo. It also resulted in a significant improvement in quality of life uh, with 36% demonstrating a large to very large improvement in Kansas City summary score. Additionally, all the biomarkers, the BNP as well as troponin trended in the absolute right direction in the context of Mavacampton compared to placebo. It has also shown a favorable impact on cardiac structure with LV mass regression, wall thickness regression, stabilization of myocardial fibrosis without significant deterioration of clinically meaningful ejection fraction. So this has the potential of changing cardiac structure in a good way downstream in the long run. Recently published again in January, every aspect of cardiopulmonary exercise testing was improved in favor of Mavacampton compared to placebo. Long-term extension study, Lots of data. Now we have up to five-year data, which is showing it is safe. Ejection fraction does not significantly drop, and the gradients remain persistently low. Patients continue to feel significantly better in the long run. That brings me to the Valor HCM trial of much sicker patients, 92% NYHA class three, 
done in 19 US HCM centers. This was a two-step study. The first step, 16 weeks, was placebo control, uh, Mavacampton versus placebo, where the drug titration was real life uh, EF and gradient measurements. Uh, the question that we asked was, if we add Mavacampton to maximally tolerated medical therapy, will that allow these severely symptomatic patients to no longer remain eligible for surgery or alcohol septal ablation? Second phase of the study was the placebo arm moved over to Mavacampton, and we wanted to see what happens to that group as well as the other group in the longer term. So let's look at what the results show. The primary endpoint, remember at baseline, every patient was a candidate for septal reduction therapy and was referred. At 16 weeks, 82% patients no longer met or need, met criteria for SRT. And at 32 weeks, 89% no longer met criteria. Compare that to placebo, vastly different. NYHA class improvement was significantly different or significantly higher in the Mavacampton group, both at 16 weeks as well as 32 weeks compared to placebo. And this was a real life study with 32% uh, patients on combination therapy, including disopyramide. At 30, 16 and 32 weeks, patients were offered a chance to go switch over to SRT, and 95% patients chose to continue on medical therapy. What about the secondary efficacy endpoint? Both resting and Valsalva gradient significantly improved in the Mavacampton group and remained low in the placebo group till week 16. They were high, and then you can see how nicely they go down. Similarly, KCCQ score improved in the Mavacampton group and even in the placebo group after week 16. Importantly, ejection fraction has remained over 60% in vast majority of the patients. Favorable cardiac remodeling, again, biomarkers, mass index, LA volume index, everything trended in the right direction in the Mavacampton group. Even markers of diastolic function like E over E prime significantly improved in the Mavacampton group. Mitral regurgitation significantly improved in the Mavacampton group versus placebo at week 16, as well as, as I alluded to, one great improvement in diastolic function was seen in significantly higher proportion in the Mavacampton group. You know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. 71-year-old patient of mine failed alcohol ablation after ablation in class three NYHA symptoms and unable to do activities of daily living. We put him on Mavacampton at week 32. At baseline, look at his ECG with LVH strain pattern. Outflow tract gradient severe. 32 weeks later, ECG has normalized. Normal ECG gradients are gone. So we are seeing this repeatedly in many patients. So this, there's something about the story uh, that is that is still being unraveled. But normalization of ECG, we think, is a pretty big deal. As I alluded to, EF, there has been concerns raised because this is a myosin inhibitor, but so far the story is that the significant drops in EF we are simply not seeing in clinical practice. Mavacampton was approved by the FDA under the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy because of concerns about EF drop and drug-drug interactions. These have to be taken into account and you as a prescriber have to be uh, cognizant of this, so along with the patients. And bottom line is this is our protocol of how we manage. Uh, patients get enrolled, we get enrolled, place the order, specialty pharmacy uh, does their magic. If you're approved, so you start the, the drug, with follow-up echo at four, eight, 12 weeks, and then every three months while taking Mavacampton, which is commercially known as Camzios. Next in class is Aficampton. Again, this is currently being tested in phase three trial, the Sequoia trial. Redwood HCM was a phase two trial, which similar to Mavacampton is showing a reduction in gradients, but without significant impact on LVEF and significant improvement in symptomatology. 
What I'm also excited about is emergence of gene therapy. Uh, adenovirus mediated gene therapy is now being developed in, in phase one study. We are, we are gonna be leading, helping lead this program where one dose of gene therapy can potentially replenish the protein that is in short supply and potentially cure the HCM. So now we are talking curing HCM in MYBPC3 type mutation. Just last week, genome editing was published by the Boston group, Cricket Seidman and, and, and colleagues, which shows genome editing can prevent HCM in mice. So lots of new stuff happening in this context. We have to assume, and assuming long-term safety and efficacy, we need to answer a few questions. How, how often do we need to continue to monitor? Who dispenses these new medications? Is it center of excellence only, primary cardiologist, or anybody care? What is the cost of long-term treatment with medicines versus one-time cost of surgery? An important question is, based on what I just showed you, would you have a suboptimal SRT at a less experienced center or have unsuitable anatomy? Or would you have a trial of Mavacampton? Should we be taking the conversation upstream and consider this as first-line therapy? We've not yet talked about non-obstructive HCM because there is no drug for that. I am pleased to announce that I'm leading a study, a randomized study, Mavacampton versus placebo in non-obstructive HCM, the Odyssey trial, which has started randomizing patients. So more data to come in the next few years. How do you currently manage non-obstructive HCM? Once your EF drops to less than 50%, uh, or if it is preserved EF, treat it like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. But once the EF drops, you have to be very careful about stopping these therapies and then treating them with guideline-directed medical therapy. In some selected patients, we use apical myectomy to debulk the myocardium to improve the stroke volume and help the patient symptomatically. You have to be careful about a symptomatic non-obstructive patient in terms of serial assessment. If you have increasing diuretic uh, requirement, arrhythmia burden, biomarkers going up, dysfunction and organ dysfunction, worsening fibrosis, decreasing functional capacity, these patients are bad actors and you may need to consider them for transplant. AFib is a really, really bad actor in this context. And we've shown no in this meta-analysis that it is associated with significant adverse events, no matter what data set you use. Getting onto it early is crucial because success rate for ablation is less than 50%. And at least in our practice, we utilize, if you're obstructive, you most definitely will get symptomatic and we utilize it as a trigger for earlier surgery. Any AF in my mind is a sign to utilize Coumadin or, or uh, anticoagulation. Don't wait for the, the chads vas score. Genetic testing, lots has been written and this is a rapidly evolving field, but fact of the matter remains, if you screen 100 patients that look HCM, no more than 40 of them will be positive for genetic mutation. So you still have to have a game plan for treating the rest but this data is rapidly evolving. How do you test genetically? If you have a gene positive patients, then you do cascade testing in their first degree relatives. Otherwise, you know, you, I typically bring them back every three to five years. Share registry is gonna shed a lot of light in terms of genetics and long-term outcomes. So more data to come. There will be some mutations that we think will be more malignant than others, but remains to be seen. How do you screen? Typically genetic testing is the way to screen, but otherwise EKG and echo one to two years in kids, every three to five years in adults. Early stage HCM, especially their non-obstructive vanish trial has shown that compared to placebo, valsartan made a dent in reducing LV wall thickness or stabilizing it mass as well as volume. So remains to be seen how 
we are going to tackle this group. But suffice to say, the pediatric HCM is going to be the next therapeutic frontier. So to conclude, future is truly bright in HCM. Precision medicine will add an additional option in our fight towards a normal life. It is certainly not about my pill is better than your procedure, but what we can do to provide the best quality of life, because ultimately we have to keep patients first. I will end by saying once new science rolls over, if you are not part of the steamroller, you become part of the road. So I think it's good to start the journey and hopefully continue it in the exciting path. Thank you so much for the invitation and I'd be happy to answer questions. Well, I, I, you know, uh, I don't know if Dr. Garcia is, uh, is in line there, but uh, you know, Dr. Garcia, you know, I just want to take the lead and just first of all, like, you know, really thank you for, for uh, you know, taking the field where we're at right now. And, and you know, um, all I, I, I know, um, I think I learned it from you, uh, and I can see that since the last time I heard kind of a, uh, a lecture from you, I think things have changed a lot. I, think I can see, like, you know, more than 50 new slides uh, since I was in Cleveland. So, which is, uh, I mean, that kind of really uh, shows how the field has kind of, uh, you know, evolved and has changed, which is with many options, which is, uh, you know, a great thing, to, uh, a great problem to have, as, as Dr. Mena would say. But anyhow, Dr. Garcia is here, so Dr. Garcia. Well, thank you, Meling. I, I, I would uh, concur with um, Aldo. Um, you know, obviously, um, the, the big question we have, uh, I have quite a few questions uh, that I wanted to ask you, but the, the main one, of course, is um, what is the niche, in your opinion, honestly, about um, uh, current use of mevacantin in patients who are eligible for myectomy? How many in the, in the Valor trial were potentially candidates for myectomy, and when do you choose one versus the other? So... All the patients in the Valor trial were candidates for myectomy, all, 100% of them. There was no patient that we thought was wishy-washy. So that's the, right now, so what, you know, what we have done, the way I think about it is there's going to be different types of patients. One is, I do not want surgery. So can I try medical therapy first? The other one is, I, you know, I'm not ready for surgery. I want to see how I feel. Maybe down the road, I could do surgery. The third group is I have high risk for surgery and my alcohol ablation uh, septal perforator is inappropriate. So that's the group. The other, I think the bigger, bigger group is lack of access. There's not too many good myectomy or alcohol septal ablation centers around the world. And, you know, there's clearly a inverse association between volume and outcomes. So that's why I made the comment, is it worth your while getting a suboptimal myectomy in a low volume center or give my uh, Mavacampton a shot? So, so I think, you know, these will shape out. So what, what are we doing at the Cleveland Clinic? Here, there are some patients who still come and say, you know what? I don't want to talk about medicine. I just want to get operated upon and move on with my life. Free country. That's fine. But, you know, if they if they are open to a conversation, we discuss, here are the options. What do you want to choose? And, and so truly, it has gotten to be shared decision making. And, and as we saw in the Valor study, 95% pay a lot, vast majority of the patients are saying, you know, let me try this first. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the concern that I have, of course, is, um, you know, when, when, when you test a new therapy, you, you test it against the standard who are symptomatic. Uh, surgery is superior than the standard old conventional medical therapy, which was, was used as a gold standard in, in, in value. So, you know, a patient coming to you asking that question, well, what is better? We don't have that answer for that, right? We don't have a comparative yeah, I, policy. It probably won't be yeah. done. It would be impossible. I, I think, guess. you know, 
Maverick Hampton versus myectomy, I doubt if something like that is going to be done. So that, I mean, look, when we were planning the Valor study, I mean, I was at the first meeting, obviously, and, you know, that thought came about, but, but this was even before the pandemic. So, you know, uh, there's no way at this point of time, there's an appetite to be doing a head-to-head -head trial like that medical therapy versus, and maybe there will be a time down the road where it would be. The fundamental thing is even the surgical data is not prospective. Most of it is observational data from large centers. So, so you know, it is what it is. But, but at the end of the day, what I see it, this is it opens a large avenue, a big, that it increases the size of the tent that patients can choose from. The buffet line just got bigger. Okay. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, given the reverse remodeling data, do you see role of Mavacampton in diastolic heart failure down the road? I, I think so. So, you know, HCM is, is, the, is a good, example of advanced diastolic dysfunction. And the fact that we are seeing some signals in this, I think the non-obstructive HCM population will uh, give an answer because there we are not treating the outflow tract gradient. There essentially we are treating uh, the degree of hypertrophy and diastolic dysfunction and myocardial energetic. So I think, yes, the field is gonna evolve towards uh, towards testing it in, in diastolic dysfunction cases. There's a second question here. It says, sudden cardiac death predictor calculators in an elderly population. The, so typically, most of us would not utilize these calculators in folks over 65. Uh, and they, the accuracy falls down. And the way I think about it is if you made it to 65, 70, I mean, you know, the Darwinian theory of survival of the fittest. So, you know, uh, I would not worry about this unless there's documented VT uh, with, with syncope, et cetera. Those may be slightly different. Dr. Sai, if, if, if I might ask a couple of questions, uh, you know, when I was back in the Cleveland and Cleveland Clinic, I, I think, you know, either to your clinic or some of the other, you know, people there, um, you know, kind of the protocol was just kind of get, you know, the patient neural agents and maybe double agents and, and see if that kind of improve, you know, of course, symptoms and, and, and LD gradient at the same time. We'll prove it with exercise and so forth. And then if the patient was there failing, then we'll go, you know, to surgery and, and you know, take into consideration all the different aspects that uh, goes into obstruction. Um, you know, now with the, with the explorer data to say that, you know, combination was not allowed, but now the Ballard, you know, combination therapy is okay. So how is the workflow right now in your clinic? Uh, when you see a patient for the first time has symptoms LDOT, you go with normal agents, you go double normal agents, and then Mavacantin versus surgery. So how's the workflow uh, for you in, 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 in terms of managing these patients? Yeah, so, so that's a very important and an interesting question, especially in, in this center, we, we have everything available. So, you know, if you are a de novo patient, first time diagnosis, so obviously we discuss lifestyle modification and all those things. Take, get rid of the bad medications that may be adding to the outflow tract obstruction. We still, uh, and the insurance companies, I think are gonna be driving this more than anybody else. We still start them on at least one agent. So most commonly beta blocker, or if not tolerated, then calcium channel blocker. Then, you know, our threshold to moving to Mavacampton has obviously gotten lower. One thing I will tell you, and this is, this has been my bias and, you know, it's only going to get worse. And this is pers my personal bias. To me, after beta blocker, I, I am not going to move to disopyramide. And disopyramide already has side effects at the clinic only three to 5% of our patients are on DISO. I mean, and that's just the way it, uh, it has evolved. And so what happens, so that's, that's my bias for monotherapy. If somebody comes with multiple therapies and then we have a heartfelt conversation, surgery 
or this. And if the patients decide to go on the route of Mavacamptan, then I initiate Mavacamptan. And then when we bring them back, then I'm thinking about down titrating some of the other medications. So if you are on 200 milligrams of Toprol and fatigued out of your mind, you know, I'm going to see, I'm going to push the envelope and see what happens when you, when you are uh, lowering uh, those. Certainly, you know, if they are on disopyramide, I'm also going to do that just about as aggressively. And, and, you know, so far on all the patients that we started on Mavacampton, maybe one or two that have transitioned to surgery because they didn't tolerate this or something happened. We've seen some cases from outside. Our surgeons have direct referrals where, you know, similar. We will have some cases where patients don't tolerate it or EF drops or, or you know, they just, the insurance company gives them the runaround or they just don't simply want this. So, so it is going to be, it's not going to be a one size fits all. Good. One, one uh, you know, I might ask like in a second one, and sorry that I'm taking over, but one, one situation that I think I struggle a lot, as particularly here at the Bronx, is that, I mean, compared to like like the pure hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient with obstruction that is like nicely book, uh, you know, case, uh, we get these these folks with obstruction uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also have like severe hypertension, and I think there's a like coexisting disease based on like you know entire workup, yeah. you know. But you know, you start with the you know normal agents, and you try to maximize that uh, as opposed to pure vasodilators. But you know, these patients still persist with blood pressure like in the 180 uh, and have you know some degree of obstruction and symptoms. So then you start like, okay, so uh, how do I really like get this under control? I guess that if you relieve the obstruction, either medication or surgery, then you get that out of the equation. But if you're stuck, how you gonna deal with these situations in terms of blood pressure management? Is is a ARV a potential? compared to others, given the fibrosis data that is like still kind of debatable or, or, or you know, cloniding. I mean, how, how do you deal with this in this situation where you cannot release destruction, you know, um, you know, right away? So that, I think that's a very important question. Before Mavacampton came out, you know, hypertension was a big and a troublesome deal. So you give beta blocker, you give calcium uh, channel blocker, they're poor antihypertensives. And then, you know, not too many options. I've tried patients on, on clonidine, et cetera. It was always a hard sell to a patient. Let me send you to heart surgery so that I can treat, treat your blood pressure better. You know, patients look at you and say, what? So but now with Mavacampton, what has happened is what we are doing, and we've seen this in many patients, you know, the blood pressure is a problematic. What I say is let's ride this through for a little bit. Let's put you on Mavacampton, see you back in a month. Oh, your gradient is next to nothing. Now I can introduce lisinopril or ARB or, or Norvas or what have you. And in fact, last week, just before I went to ACC, there was a patient of mine who was uncontrolled hypertensive. And this strategy, her blood pressure is now in the 120s and she's feeling much better. So, and I, even at ACC, we, we were at a couple of panels and patients, and I was talking to some of my other colleagues across the country and they're also seeing the same thing. So, so I think, you know, good unintended consequence would be better managed blood pressure with, with normal standard agents. I think there is a question here from who I know is an electrophysiologist. So I am not an electrophysiologist. If ablation and HCM, usually best thing is ablation, but require non-PV triggers and average of two procedures. What do you recommend? So number one, what I tell my patients is if you have AFib, we send them for, we treat the AFib earlier. If they are a surgical candidate, we send them for surgery earlier. And I recommend a, a full uh, cut and sew maze with left atrial appended ligation. I always have shared decision-making with my patients. And I this is what I tell them. It's only a half joke. Is like, no matter what the success rate the electrophysiologist or the surgeon gives you, reduce that number by 10 or 20%. So if your surgeon says 70% success rate, I say it's 50 to 60%. Because we've just seen it is, AFib is a bad actor and we need to jump earlier on it. Uh, Melina, I have uh, two questions, uh, if, if I may. Um, 
Uh, one is related to AFIP since since you mentioned and I, I agree. I mean, certainly the 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 one of the worst um, uh, conditions to have uh, atrial fibrillation combined with this uh, HOCUM, not only because of the difficulty controlling symptoms, but uh, the very very high risk of a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, a, do you have any data on um, uh, left atrial appendage closure um, compared with anticoagulation in these patients? And the other question I had is uh, uh, related to what you very clearly demonstrated that there are patients that have pathology of the mitral valve that is predominant, whether um, you have any experience using mitral clip alone or in combination with alcohol um, ablation. Yes, so first question, uh, I think not necessarily in the context of HCM, but there are there's emerging surgical literature that LA appendage clip is uh, better than, than just pure anticoagulation. I know there was just a recent analysis in the Watchman literature, which showed that it also has better value. That was a paper. I think it's that paper is getting a lot of bad press, but, but there was data that suggested that it is better than anticoagulation. The second the other aspect, yes, uh, Paul Saraja at Minneapolis Heart has published a paper in patients with advanced HCM who, who are not really surgical candidates. Mitra clip may have a role, especially if it is a primary mitral valve pathology. I will tell you where all these things are coming into play in an unusual field is the folks who are undergoing evaluation for transcatheter mitral valve replacement, so mitral prim prim primary mitral valve pathology. A lot of these patients, they're older and they have very narrow outflow tracts. And once the new valve is put in, they, there are some episodes of outflow tract obstruction. So the concept of neo-LVOT prediction is, is real. And that's where I've seen patients uh, Providers do alcohol septal ablation as well as, you know, think about the mitral valve and can we do a clip to avoid this. So it may or may not be in the context of HCM, but certainly that 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 anatomic interplay is, is being thought of and addressed. And there is there's something else that is there, uh, the Chinese group has from Xi'an has presented. So radio frequency ablation. So not using alcohol ablation, but RF ablation to shrink the thickened basal septum. So that there's also a paper that was published recently. I didn't mention that, uh, but but so more and more people, uh, more and more people are uh, thinking along those lines. Lots of new stuff coming. Thank, thank, thank you so much again for uh, sharing your time and your wisdom. Um, looking at your background, the trees are green and blooming in Cleveland and yeah. the grass is green. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I, I suspect that the picture is not reflecting uh, current no. reality. No, right no, no, no. This is just a picture. We have to pretend that this is just, you know, yeah. Uh, it's wishful thinking, which is yeah. uh, the experience. Right? <laughs> but it's sunny. It's sunny and hardly any snow like you guys. So, you know, on this part of the world, climate change results in no snow in February. So anyway, thank you so much for the invitation. And I had I had a great time and look forward to seeing you guys again in person at some point of time in a meeting. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Bye.